Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Moving Spotlight Podcast. Glad you're all here. Glad you're all listening. I feel like I might have used exciting last week, but I'll use it again. It's, <laughs> it's exciting. exciting. It's it's fine. Right, Corbin? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I love it. my main man here. How you hey, doing today, Corbin? I am doing good. Yeah, I'm good. It's a little yeah. drizzly out, so it's kind of nice. It's like cozy weather, you know? It's good. <laughs> yep. Yep. Nice when it, nice when it rains. Mm -hmm. um, Corbin, let's chat about your favorite food or to eat or cook. Ooh, uh, um, yeah. my favorite food, the other day I made uh, risotto with pancetta and porcini mushrooms. And you know, when you normally cook, it's like, you, you, you judge it. You're like, oh, I put too much salt at this point, whatever. And like, you keep going. I blew it out of the park. I was like, I was impressed oh, by it. <laughs> it yeah. was like for a date too. And I was like, yeah, I nailed it. <laughs> it's like had a little side salad. It was the best thing I ever made. But in general, I love Italian food. So like risotto or like pasta, definitely top of the list yep. for me. But Oh, I love that risotto. I nailed it. <laughs> I was really proud of it. A lot of cheese, a lot of carbs. Can't really go wrong. <laughs> that that sounds really good. Really, really, really good. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, you? What do you What do you like to cook and eat? I, for some reason, I'm just thinking of like cooking disasters. So one is I used to love <laughs> I used to love bread pudding, and then I saw what went into it, and it was like sugar, sugar, eggs, mm, sugar, mm -hmm. sugar, eggs, butter. I'm like what and it's yeah. like this is why it tastes so good actually yeah i should have never made bread pudding that was a mistake <laughs> i can still order it i just can't make it and then the other thing was um i love i love grilling that's one of my favorite things mm. to do and we had another couple over uh and my wife i didn't realize had put olive oil on the chicken oh no <laughs> i'm grilling it yeah i'm grilling it and and she's telling them what a like I, john's really good at the grill and the olive oil is dripping and it's like Just flaming up explosion. and they're like on the other side of the back that yeah it's like <laughs> flaming up and i'm like what is i keep closing like the lid and then i open it and it's like flames and i close it i'm like hey, it was like john's out of control really good. john's really good yeah, john's real and she's like that's what made it worse too and i was like first of all don't say that i'm already insecure about my grilling with other people around i got nervous yeah. um it ended up actually being okay somehow. I can't I think I like come back with one eyebrow. Yeah, you guys ready yeah. for dinner? <laughs> but now I've got a new formula for for what goes on the on the chicken. Yeah. That's that's no much oil. much. Uh, <laughs> no, no olive oil. Yeah. So, um, but uh, so I'm glad yours worked out and, yeah, and both mine of mine were disasters, Corbett. That's good. <laughs> good to good to know. Um, I guess we have food on the brain because we're we're hungry. But yeah, I want to transition here. I want to transition over to um to our guest. We've got an exciting guest today. Uh, she is a career coach for actors. I want to welcome to the show uh, someone that I'm excited for everyone to get to know and meet, Emily Grace. Emily, welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I didn't yes. know you're not supposed to use olive oil on the grill. Is that <laughs> well, <laughs> it gets fiery very you, quick. <laughs> you probably, I don't know. Have you? Done, you probably can. Maybe you can. I just, I don't. There was just a lot of it. I think so. Oh, it was okay. just, I don't know. I think it's it's the proportions. Uh, Got it. Yeah, that's all it. I've ever used, and oh. I don't really know how to grill. I'm just sort okay. of like, oh, I can do this. I can figure <laughs> yeah. it out. But yeah. it's like, oh no, what a, what faux pas have I made? <laughs> yeah, it can be. It's do you, just, you do a little too much. It can get like you just if it drips all the way to the chicken, that's really when it gets bad. So Annie must have really <laughs> slathered it on there. That's what I think. I think it was like it was been, yeah, deeply, <laughs> deeply marinated. Uh, Emily, is there something you like to make special to you? Have uh, roasted chicken is actually one of my specialties. No. So sounds delicious. I just made it the other day. Oh great! Look at that. Well, so now good. I'm extra hungry um, <laughs> and still haven't had breakfast. Um, Emily, I want to, I want to jump right in. Uh, can you tell us about uh, the Pickford West creator, creator lab? Yes. Um, so Pickford West is the name of my company and creator lab is the name of the program. Um, so Pickford West is, uh, wasn't the name was inspired by two pioneering women of the golden age of Hollywood, Mary Pickford and May West who I find inspiring because at, at the time, there was no real playbook of Hollywood or like this is the way things happen. It was really a new industry. And these were two women who really took control of their own success. They carved out their own paths. And the choices that they made and the, what they created are things that are actually still around today. Um, so Mary Pickford was the first actor to start a production company with other actors Great. and they called it United Artists, which is mm. a brand that has, you know, uh, what's the word? The test of time, the word yep. I can't think of. Withstood, Stood the test withstood, of time. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yep. I have just had my coffee. Uh, <laughs> and Mae West was a really like sex positive gay rights advocate, really pushing the envelope actress who wrote for herself. Mm. And uh, she wrote you know, lines like, oh, why don't you come up and see me sometime? Or is that a gun in your pocket? Or are you just happy to see me? Like all cool. of that, which is recognizable. Yeah, I thought I wrote written. that line. That's not a real, yeah. that, was, that was already written. Okay, good to know. Good to know who I'll attribute it to. Okay. Oh, I see. <laughs> Amazing. Our first, our our first, first snort on the show. All right. All right. We've broken the seal. Uh, Everybody, yes. Uh, but so, you know, Mae West was writing lines like that in the 30s and we still recognize them today mm. so that was the inspiration for the name of the company and then the way that i help actors now i've sort of evolved in how i help people over the years um, but the current version of how i help people is helping actors write their screenplay i think there are so mm. many actors who feel like they're not getting in the rooms, they're not going out for the roles that they should be, and they feel like they have to wait for permission or wait to get picked. And what I love to do is help people actually create something for themselves that's based on either a personal story or a, a burning desire that they have to tell a story or some kind of on-screen representation that they are not seeing and actually be the one to create it themselves. So that's what we do inside of Creator Lab is it's a step-by-step -step program uh, developed in partnership with my writing mentor, who's a TV writer named Olivia Cortero Briggs. And she contributed all of the writing curriculum. So it's a really high level, professional level writing program. And then I've contributed all of my experience on the festival circuit and how to self-produce. And then I'm, you know, one of my specialties is really helping people move through their doubt and give them tangible steps so that they don't feel totally overwhelmed. Actually, yeah, I want to dive into that because I for sure, like I've never considered myself a writer. So I like for me, that is the hardest part of like, um, and I have like a billion and one questions that you we don't have enough time to answer. But like you mentioned producing and all those things, like how do you how do you convince somebody one to write something? Cause like, for me, it's like, I got a good idea, but it's like the dialogue struggles with me. But then on top of that, I'm also like, I really like sci-fi, but I shouldn't write sci-fi because of budget reasons. <laughs> so I'm wondering how do you tackle those two things with somebody who's new and not that confident in writing? Well, that is the perfect person to join the program. <laughs> yeah, like the description <laughs> for of sure. The person. You could send uh, uh, Corbin your bill later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's just I, like, I nailed the know. line. Perfect. <laughs> got you nailed it. <laughs> yes, that is the ideal client. Um, so you know, just I don't convince anyone that they should write. They have to. They have to want to. Um, but I think there are a lot of actors who feel like. I have a story within me, but I don't know how. That's sort of the starting point. Um, anyone can learn to write. It is a discipline, just like acting. It is a craft. And it's really just about having the right teacher with the right tools in a way that makes sense to your brain. Mm. Um, and I think actors are sort of the perfect person to learn how to write because we know about storytelling we know about character building what usually i see lacking when people come to us is uh they can write a really great engaging scene but they don't know how to craft a full story so that's one of the things that we help people do I don't know. What was the second part about the question about producing or You're producing like budget like, reasons? Like sometimes it's good to just do a story that takes place in your house, you know, like something that's a little bit yes. easier. So you don't have to buy a location or whatever. So I'm wondering how you tackle yes. that too. Cause it's already hard to think of the story, let alone <clears throat> doing like a whole thing that's budget conscious as well. Yes, that is exactly right. And we do, if you do intend to self-produce, one of the things that we talk about is to keep that producibility in mind. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also get really creative, even when you have limitations on your locations. Um, you know, there was this short film where it kind of took place in the bathroom and there was something like a demon or monster or something in the toilet. And so one of the Obviously. shots was like from, <laughs> of course, right? But you never saw it, right? Mm. It was just one of those horror where they were mm, sort of smart. alluding to this horrible thing that we never actually saw. But one of the shots was like from inside of the toilet with the people looking over and sort of this ominous 
-hmm. feeling. So even when you have a limited budget, you can find ways to get creative with, with how you shoot things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just thinking about, I went to, um, this was a long time ago. I went to this guy, his name, I think is like Dove, Dove Simons. Have you heard of him? He does a two, he does a two day Hollywood film school. I feel like I have <clears throat> heard of the name. Okay. So sure. I went, I went a long time ago with a friend of mine, but, but what I remember about it is he talks about like the movie Saw, how Saw starts out like in one room, you know what I mean? For, for, yeah. for a yeah. big part of it, kind of what you're talking about Corbin, you know, and then they kind of expands out from under there, but they were very, you know, his telling of it, they were very conscious of the budget and, you know, how to kind of make it work and make an interesting story in that, you know, with what they had available to them, that was something that that they obviously uh, prioritized. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Emily, when you have people that are like, they're pursuing like acting and auditioning, and then they're also, you know, wanting to create their own projects. How do you kind of put those two together? Like, do you kind of say like, well, continue to like, do it in your free time? Do you say, let's make it, let's make a, you know, a timeline and like, let's work them at the same time. Like, how do mm -hmm. you kind of like, like balance, balance that? It's a great question, and that is the challenge of what I do. <laughs> of course. <laughs> that is the challenge because when you're pursuing acting, it's sort of like that is the most important thing, and everything gets shoved to the side when that audition comes, and everything feels kind of urgent, and then all these other things just sort of get shoved to the side. So that is absolutely the challenge. Um, one of the things that we help people do is start small. Mm -hmm. um, if you set out to write a feature film or a TV pilot right out of the gate and you have never written anything before, of course, it's going to feel overwhelming. It's going to feel like a huge, daunting project. Um, and especially when people try to figure it out all by themselves, that's when they get into trouble because there's procrastination, there's overwhelm, there's the, I have no idea what I'm doing or how to move forward. There's the doubt of like, is this any good? So I always recommend that when you are willing to put in the time to write something that you do it in an environment that challenges you to do the work and to be consistent. But one of the, one of the ways that we try to make it work is by starting small with something tangible. Mm -hmm. Um, in creator lab, the first thing that people do is write a short film. So a 10 minute or a short play, you know, a short something narrative in a medium of your choice. But the goal is to write something that's 10 pages with the beginning, middle and end. Anyone can do that, right? That is doable. 10 pages, you can absolutely do that. And then once you have that accomplishment and that success, it builds your confidence that actually you do know how to write and you can, you can approach bigger projects as well. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Oh, John, do you have a question? Sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say, um, in, in that world, I, I love that. And, and I know you mentioned where people can find, you know, maybe find stories or maybe they have ideas, but when, um, when people are looking for inspiration or maybe when, when you're looking for inspiration, what are, what are things like you suggest, or, you know, what are, what are ways to kind of like kickstart that, uh, the fountain? The font, of font of inspiration. I just meant that. Uh, I don't know. Fountain of inspiration. <laughs> I don't like it. Oh, I <laughs> oh second <laughs> snort. Hey, oh, I haven't gotten one snort. This is this uh, is upsetting. Right. Keep trying. Keep firing. Keep firing, Carver. Keep firing. It'll happen. I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> it was about finding. It, uh, <laughs> it was about finding inspiration. Where you go, or where you kind of you know help guide people towards if if they're you know. They're like, oh, this is okay. This is okay, and they they want to kind of find inspiration. In terms of what to write about or where to begin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think it depends on the person. Some people come in, they have a story they know they want to tell. Mm -hmm. Often, especially with actors, it's based on a personal experience. Um, I don't know about you guys, but. There is always a part of me that is observing my life from a from an outside perspective and like, oh, that would make such a great movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So I think mm -hmm. actors generally living their lives sort of have that writer's view of stories that they might want to turn into something. Um, so some people come in knowing what they want to write about. They just don't know how to begin. And then some people come in knowing they want to write something for themselves to act in, but they don't have an idea. Mm -hmm. um, so with the person who comes in that doesn't have an idea, the first thing that we focus on is character. 
we don't focus on structure. We don't focus on uh, the story itself, but really helping you develop a compelling character. So for an actor, you probably have an idea of what kind of acting you want to do, what kind of projects really resonate with you. And you also know what you're not getting called in for, right? There's always that role of like, oh, that would have been perfect for me, but I can't, I'm not getting seen at that level or they're not, not going to call me in for that. So anytime there's a role that you felt like, oh, that would have been perfect for me. That's a great indicator of what kind of story you actually want to tell. Um, so we would look at, we have a tool called the character square which is one of the foundational first steps that people take, which is how to develop a compelling character. So uh, each major character has four essential elements, which are their external want, their superpower, their fatal flaw, and their inner need. If mm -hmm. you can do the work to develop that for yourself as an actor and for one other character, you have a great beginning to spark some ideas of, of what to write about. Great. Yeah. I like, I like that a lot. I like the, the ability to be able to start paying attention to what you like, you know, is it's very personal and creative. And I think people lose sight of that a little bit. You, you start to think, oh, everybody likes this kind of character, but it really is something that you can play. Um, and I like that uh, kind of a bit of a pivot. I'm curious with um, uh, more on b building that like trusted network. Like I'm curious how you, how you recommend people because for me, the fear is always like, I don't want to make The Room by Tommy Wiseau. You know, like, I want to do something that's like embarrassing for my career forever. <laughs> so like, I'm, I'm wondering, <laughs> how do you, how do you find people who would be honest with you and like tell you like, obviously, the, the, the Creator Lab is a good place to have good like writers and stuff, but like directors, um, producers, like people that in your network, like, what do you recommend for like creating the actual project after you get it written to a place that you like, um, but you don't want to do something embarrassing at the end of the day? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Of, I mean, right? Like, why would we do all of this work mm -hmm. to embarrass ourselves? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So we're starting from the point of... Good, it's good been... question, Corbin. Good question, yes, Corbin. Great, I great wanted Corbin question. to feel that way. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Could you snort for me, please, John? Three snorts. There you go. Three snorts. You got three snorts. Okay. Go ahead, Emily. Oh, this is great. Okay. So... <laughs> We're starting from the point of assumption that this has been a well-written, fully workshop script. We know it's good. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Yes, yes. And then what happens after it's written? Great. Okay, so inside Creator Lab, we have a module. Actually, one of my clients just shot her short film and was like, thank God you made me watch that module. So it's about um, your building your ideal dynamics before you hire your team. Mm -hmm. So as the writer, cool. especially if you're an actor who plans to act in it and maybe direct, you know, there, you're going to be wearing multiple hats on this project. You are in a leadership role in a way that you typically aren't as the actor who's hired to just come in and do your job and then leave, right? When mm -hmm. you are the, the creator of this project, you really need to, to understand how to step into a role of leadership. And the first thing uh, that I recommend inside of the self-production course inside Creator Lab is really get clear about the dynamics you wanna have with your team before you hire your team. Um, you know, what kind of communication style do you prefer? What kind of shared values do the people on your team need to have? How do you want to feel uh, in terms of people being on board with this vision that you've created? And I also recommend, and this I think is tough for actors, um, because we get excited and creating and collaborating seems so fun in the beginning. And it's like, oh, I'll just hire my friend and that, and it's easy. What I recommend is actually you put every person through the same hiring process, even if you're paying them very little or you're not paying them at all, you know, depending on what's doable for you, but that you actually make people go through a, a very specific hiring process that is designed to reveal those qualities that you're looking for. As people go through the hiring process, it will reveal their work style and whether they're reliable and if they actually follow through. All of those things get revealed in this hiring process that we teach inside the course, which will really help you get the exact right people on your team 
that is the first step to avoiding the embarrassment, right? You want to make sure mm-hmm. everyone on the team is on like respects you and is on board with the vision and that they are reliable to do the job that they're hired to do. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> I think that's great, Emily, because a lot of times it's like bringing together like a family, you know, or community yes. and 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 sometimes, you know, oh, I've worked with this person before. I know they're great. I can bring them on. But a lot of times that person's busy, but they recommend like two people. And you're like, well, I don't know either of these two That's people. Right. I know that person, but you're starting to get like one or two or three steps removed. And sometimes that can work out great. And sometimes that can, you know, really be challenging. And so I love this idea of setting up the dynamic because I think that is, uh, you know, a great way to try to explore the relationship <laughs> before you're on set. And, and, and yes. you know, when, when things are like- By inter- then it's too late, right? Yeah. Especially yes. if it's like a short two day, three day shoot. Yeah. By the time you find out, you made the wrong choice, it's already too late. <laughs> yeah, and, and I always think it's interesting. I think it's almost like, um, it's hard to judge people when everyone's in a good mood and things are going great. It's like you really start to see character when things go wrong <laughs> and how people act and respond, you know? And I think there's a way to, because it gets projects like this, they do get stressful. It's just part of part of part of the the world of it. The play I'm in last night, where you're having some issues with all our tech stuff, and it just it gets a little tight. And you yes. want to have a team that knows it's going to get tight, and that's okay. We're not going to turn on each other like mm-hmm. piranhas. Do piranhas <laughs> eat each other? Um, no, but we're not going to turn on each other. Uh, no snort. Um, we're not going to turn on each other uh, and 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 attack each other. We're going to keep getting through this, you know. Yeah. And I think that's like you know, I, I I completely think that's that's a wonderful you know thing to be discovering. Well, Emily, I want to, I want to, I want to just jump in a little bit. So, your journey to the Creators Lab, you uh, were an actress, and and I don't know, it still are, or you know, kind of, have you kind of transitioned? But, but just, I just want to hear a little bit about how you kind of got to where you where you are. Great. Um, I always consider myself an actress, whether I'm actively pursuing it or not. Yes. Um, so I started out. I went to. I went to NYU for drama, graduated, and pretty soon after that, I hustled my way into an independent film. I had no agent. It was just, you know, my own ambition and efforts. I ended up landing the lead in this independent film, which went on to win awards at Sundance, and it won these awards Mm -hmm. all over the world. And I was the lead. I was in every scene except the one flashback. And so, of course, I was like, oh, I've... I'm the next it girl. Like, <laughs> this is it for me and I've made it and all the doors of the industry are going to open to me and my phone's going to start ringing. And none of that happened. <laughs> uh, I actually struggled to even get signed by an agent after that, wow. which at that point I sort of was like, well, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what to do now. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, I was in my early 20s. I was new to the business. As I said, I, I landed this role of my own. So I had no guidance and no mentors. And at that time, I don't know if it's changed now, but at the time, NYU did not teach you anything about the business side of the business. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I had no idea what I had was missing or what I had done wrong or what to do. Um, and that sort of led me to have to get a day. I mean, I had a day job before the film, but I had to get another day job, um, which I ended up working in a production company. And right. inside of that experience, I really got to see the behind the scenes of how the industry works and how deals get made. And the one thing, like the biggest lesson that I learned from that experience was how important relationships are and how important it is to invest in your relationships as as your priority. Um, Because I knew how to hustle my way into an opportunity, but I had no habit of follow-up afterwards. Um, So that was very eye-opening to me. And whenever I would learn something new about the business, I I would be the actor that'd be like, hey friends, let me teach you everything I just learned. I loved sharing knowledge and I loved helping people. So that sort of felt like a natural fit to evolve into coaching. Um, So I started coaching people on their marketing plan and I was, uh, I got certified as a Reiki instructor. So I was pairing Reiki like energy work with 
business plans, which apparently people do now is it's like a normal thing. But at the mm -hmm. time, it was not a normal thing. It was yeah. like, it was unusual. Mm -hmm. um, and I kept finding the people that wanted Reiki didn't want to pay. And the people that wanted the marketing didn't care about the Reiki. So I had to drop <laughs> the Reiki and just started focusing on, on marketing tools and relationship building. Um, and I did that for, for a number of years and, uh, eventually I ended up partnering with an actress who had developed an audition technique and we opened an acting studio in LA, um, for several years. So then was, the focus sort of shifted to audition techniques and how to book roles. And then I decided I was ready to go back on my own again. Um, so I... Uh, from that sort of has evolved into the creator lab because I kept finding every time someone would ask me, how do I get an agent or how do I get more auditions or how do I get in the casting room? I, my eyes would just start to glaze over. I just realized this doesn't, these conversations don't interest me anymore. And there are some coaches that love to talk about that stuff that are completely amazing. Like I would get excited when someone was like, I want to write a film. I want to produce a film. And I'd be mm. like, okay, I can, I can help you with that. Um, so that really excited me and I wanted to be able to help people write, but I also kind of felt like, mm, I don't, I felt a little fraud syndrome around the writing part. Um, cause I had struggled to write my own project as well it was, I was one of those actors that had an idea forever and I would yeah. try to write and try to write and change my mind and feel doubt. And that led me to this writing class, which is where I met Olivia. And there was just something about the way Olivia teaches that uh, worked for me because I had studied writing with other teachers over the years and just kind of felt like ugh, overwhelmed and <laughs> yeah. don't know what I'm doing still. Um, but but working with her was really eye opening. She's an amazing person. She's an amazing, successful TV writer who also happens to be a great instructor. Um, so that class was amazing. I finally wrote a pilot in a couple of months that I had been thinking about for years. That was really exciting. And then I was like, oh, I really wish I could get Olivia to come in and help me teach this program. So I just kind of mentioned it to her offhand once. And months later, she was like, hey, I just looked at your website finally. And yeah, I want to work with you. And I was like, cool. Are you sure? <laughs> really? Okay. And so that from that, we developed the Creator Lab. Um, cool. And since then, we've had, you know, we officially opened our doors last April. And okay. since then, we've had, I want to, I don't know the exact number, but definitely at least 25. And I feel like maybe more like 40 short films have been written inside of the program, which is exciting Congrats, like, yeah. stories and characters and things that were only existing in people's minds or actually live on the page and people are moving into self-production and so the program is working and that's you know that excites me more than anything i love that how did you know that she was someone i know you took her class uh that you two would work together well as partners because i think it's important how we find our our partners uh, yeah, yeah. It's a great question um, because part, I mean, we're not partner business partners, which I think is part of the key for me anyway, because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I've been in partnership and that I found very challenging um, because I want to be able to make decisions without having to consult someone. So f I think partnership works when you know back to this idea of like setting the dynamics before you get into it. You have to know yourself, your work style and, and your needs and expectations. And the other person has to know as well. Um, so for me with Olivia, what made me feel like it would be a good match is um, she always says what she's going to do and she always delivers on time. For me, mm. that is hugely important. Um, so I felt like I could rely on her and I knew her teaching style was high quality because I had experienced it myself. And then just in terms of what what made it doable for me is we are collaborators on this course, but we're not business partners on, on everything. So I still feel that autonomy. I can make decisions about other things that I offer and, you know, that that makes it work for me. Yeah, I was just thinking, I, I just putting it through my own people I partner with, Corbin can attest to this, Emily, 
it, that's interesting what you said about the decision making because like for me what i happens uh, corbin what's the term you use where my focus like just starts creeping wider and wider? Uh, uh, scope it's like creep. i just yeah. I, so I have i have what's good core called scope creep so i'm just like let's do all these things and corbin's like let's just do this one thing really well and i'm like good point point. and my wife is the same way and the guy <laughs> i produced my movie with is the same way they're all like very detail oriented and i'm much more like the bigger yeah. that i've found for myself that type of partner works great with me because uh they get value from, you know, I don't know, my, my energy and what I'm excited about and what I'm good at. And I get value from them from what they're good at, what they're smart about, what they want to focus on, you know, and sign up kind of that big picture, little pictures, not that we can't do the other ones, but it like they blend really well together. And so I think it's, whether it's like the setup of like, you know, how the business is set up or the complementing skills, I think it's such yeah. a great thing to find, you know, that, you know, I was just thinking above when with the so the movie I produced called Solver with my writing partner, I helped I we we wrote it together. He would like crank out scenes like really fast, which was great because like, you know, I'd kind of like analysis paralysis and stuff. He would crank out scenes. But I'd be like, okay, Jack, this feels like a line I've heard in like 10 movies. So how do we make this less cliche and make it more unique to the film? And so then we would work it together and come up with something. And I think that's like, since he wasn't an actor, kind of didn't come as much from the creative side, he was really good at cranking out the scene, but then kind of giving it a little more of the heart. And so finding ways like that to work together, yeah. for me, have always been really important. Does that make sense, Emily? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, you know, what you're saying is exactly right. You need to find people who complement one another. Yeah. I was just talking to somebody and she was talking about her, her two kids and her one kid is really just like, go, go, go and does things and whatever. And her other kid, like, will think about it, think about it, think about it. And she said, the ship will just pass while you're thinking about it rather than jumping on. <laughs> and I really like that, like visualization analogy to it. Cause it's like, yeah, John, you, you're like, let's do this wacky thing. Like, and it's so, it's always like, Oh, I don't know. And then I start to panic, but then we do it and it's great, you know, and it's just kind of figuring out the balance between details versus, you know, going to the sky and seeing what happens. Yeah, I think those are, those are, those are, and I think also, I, I think it also depends on the field you're in. We're in a creative field, which yeah. has, like you were saying, you know, even Emily earlier about like kind of the business side and the, almost the, the business side and the Reiki side. It's like, we have two different parts. No, we really, we have two different <laughs> yes. parts of our brain and, 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 you know, we have to kind of, I think feed both of those, you know, I mean, it's, it's people I'm sure have heard it before, but it's why, you know, they call it show business. There's a business part of the, of, of the show. And so I think it, there's something to be said for when you're, you know, being creative, letting stuff flow, but then also you've got to be, you know, smart about the business side. You've got to understand a budget. You've got to, you know, another thing that happens, uh, Emily, I'm sure you can attest to this is a lot of times people, if they have any type of budget, once they're past writing, they spend it all just on filming and they completely forget about post-production, uh, right? Yes. And, you know, and like, yes. and you, you, sometimes you're even warned. You're like, I know we shouldn't, but we just got to get it in the can, you know? And so they do that. And then post-production comes like, Oh, geez, there's all this stuff. It's like, yeah, you, they're, they're, you know, and I think that's part of the learning process where hopefully if you have a guide or teacher, maybe you hear it, you know? Yes, that's something you don't want to find out the hard way. Yeah. Once you've spent all your money on production, <laughs> you yeah. can get into big tr trouble, especially if it's a feature. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, then there's a lot of, lot of work to do. Uh, Emily, I want to, um, because one of the things I noticed on your website, it feels like you're you're into you know tell me if this is the right phrase like kind of like female empowerment or women you know and so so can you talk a little bit about about that world and and what you were you know excited about in there okay let me think about what i want to say about that so yes my focus is women as the priority and i've you know i we were talking before before we started recording i've sort of become more flexible on that but my mission is to help people who have felt marginalized by the industry to actually take their success into their own hands and you know as a woman i relate to women i feel that struggle as a woman but i know there are more people that feel very marginalized whose stories are just as valuable and just as impactful, even if the the Hollywood industry is sort of slow to, to pick up on that. Um, and I've always been someone who wants to create my own opportunities, like I did with that film that went to Sundance. I wasn't waiting around because I didn't have an agent. I wasn't like waiting around. I was out there. I was making uh progress i was taking action to to create my own opportunities um that's what excites me and so people that resonate with that who don't feel like waiting 
who don't want to feel like they have to get permission, who are like, no, I'm going to create something for myself. I'm going to create my own opportunities. Those are the people that really excite me. And I just think in terms of the history of the industry, it has been very white male centric in terms of the writers who's in front of and behind the camera. And I think we're just, we're overdue for more diversity for different kinds of stories told by the people who have lived that and experienced that. And I think there is a real, uh, especially in the last couple of years, I think there is a real awakening that there is not only uh, a desire to tell those stories. There is a, a desire for people to see themselves reflected in those stories as well. So instead of me sitting around going, oh, this is terrible. And why won't things change? It's like, oh, I can help. I can help move this change along in my own way. That's great. What are you, what have you been excited about that has changed that to people that have been marginalized and what are you excited to change? Like, what are the things that you're like kind of being on the forefront of what that's going to be? excited to see. I am excited for some of the most fantastic projects of the last couple of years have actually been actress created. Mm -hmm. um, Fleabag, uh, I may, this may destroy you. I may destroy you. I'm getting the title wrong. It's one of those. Yep. Uh, Insecure, Pen15, like there's so much amazing content that has come out over the last couple of years that is exploring stories in a raw sort of irreverent amazing way that that i really relate to and see myself reflected in that is shining a light on topics that have been considered taboo and it's like the the phenomenal success of these kind of projects points to the fact that people want to see that so to mm -hmm. me what i'm excited about is seeing more women uh, writers, more women directors, really digging deep into these kind of stories and then seeing people actually really resonate with it and, and buy the content, experience the content. And then what was the second thing? Was the second? <laughs> uh, well, the first, yeah, the first part Corbin was like, what did you- Corbin loves these two-parters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No one remembers the second part, Corbin. Just make them one I know, I need to short more goddamn concise. question, okay? <laughs> Why has it gotta be a two-parter? Jesus, okay. okay. Don't worry two, about it, you did, not Yeah, jeez. <laughs> I don't even remember. No, uh, you don't I don't even remember. Okay, great. <laughs> no, I was just wondering what has changed, and then also like what you're excited about to change. Which you kind of it's a same similar world for both of them. Hmm. hmm. I'm what I'm excited for to change is uh, more people come through the Creator Lab or other programs like it who actually realize how much power they have to create their own stuff and to get it out there. Mm -hmm. um, we're in an era where anyone can make a film. If you, if you own a cell phone with a camera, you can actually make a film. And because of the internet and streaming and YouTube and all of these places where you TikTok, where you can share your content, you don't need to go through a traditional route to be a filmmaker and to build an audience. And, uh, I took a seminar a few years ago with Peter Maselli, Peter Michelli. I don't know. How, he's a manager at one of the big, big management companies. And one of the things that he said that stuck with me was like, you don't need a, a huge audience to be a hit anymore because of streaming services. You can actually have a very small but mighty audience who loves your content and be a huge hit. Um, so you don't need the kind of backing or money or or eyeballs that you used to to be considered a huge success and what's exciting about me is like it's absolutely doable for anyone who wants to write a story that they're passionate about and get it made and get it seen mm -hmm. and have you seen with you know the festivals that you've like submitted to and everything like is that kind of a world that is difficult to get into and has to do with stories like that or like is it, is it different at all i think uh, there's definitely of course the prestigious festivals, the Sundances, mm -hmm. the South by Southwest, of course, those are very more increasingly difficult to get into every year that goes by. Um, but there are smaller festivals. There's a uh, websites like short of the week. You can distribute it yourself on YouTube. You can use social media to build an audience. So I think it just, it really depends on what your goals are for this film that you've made. Um, what channels would make the most sense for you to then distribute it 
Mm. True. Emily, when people go through your program, are are is are you um, or are some people are they trying to sell their script or are they all of them self producing? I'm just curious because you know that sometimes is kind of a different goal. Like this is a script I'm trying to make and sell and you know maybe be a part of or not, or this mm -hmm. is a script that I'm definitely going to produce myself and just raise the budget for. Yeah, those are definitely very different tracks for mm -hmm. sure. Um, we have a mix of people. Some people okay. definitely want are writing it to act in, yeah. so that would most likely be a self-production route. There are some people who are writing that want to be able to sell, um, you know, to a to a production company and sort of sell it and be done with it. And there are other people that would like to be able to sell it and still be attached. So those are all sort of different routes, and that's one of the reasons why it's great for us to have Olivia as part of the team um, because she is in the trenches of that world day in, day out and really has a uh, very specific insight onto at least how she's approached that process and how it's worked for her. But I do think, you know, even with that, there are traditional routes, get a literary agent and get your meetings set up and have your two samples. And that is a route, but there are other routes as well. You know, you can find a champion at a production company who can help you set up meetings. You can get an entertainment lawyer who really uh, believes in you, who can help you get meetings in that way. So even with that, there are different routes to get from, you know, a finished script to, to selling it. Yeah. How do you? Uh, yeah, uh, I just. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I just, I was just gonna say, I just, I did think it's so important with what you're saying that mm -hmm. the what an artist or an actor has control over writing something. You know, if you're if you're waiting for auditions, that's such a challenging thing or a challenging time. And so when you have control over, you know, it's hard to to just like act in a vacuum you know it, it helps when you hit you're on set or you have yes. you know self tapes or you're doing a play or something but it's hard just to like you know well, what am i just if i'm home but i think writing is something that it feels it can be a challenge but it's something that like can feel like okay this is also leading me towards my goals and it's something i can be proactive about and so mm -hmm. i think with what you're saying I, I i love that idea that you know sometimes life happens and you got to work or you got a last minute self tape come up but when you've got your time you know you can you can work on you know pushing this project or a project forward. And I think that's so nice to have. It's so great to have. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in the long run, if you focus on becoming a good writer, that will probably take you further in your career in the long run, because mm -hmm. you put yourself into a different category um, where you, uh, you know, someone who only acts, uh, you have to wait for auditions or you have to wait for offers or you have to, you do a lot of waiting until you, you know, get to the tipping point where you can make bigger calls in your career. But if you learn how to write and you know how to produce, you're one of those multi hyphenates, you come inherently with many more skills that could be valuable to productions and to people that you want to build relationships where you get to build these relationships in a different way than when you're just the actor like i hope you cast me in your project one day um, yeah so i, I, I feel know. like that's less and less common you know yeah. in my opinion you know you're you're totally right i feel like that's less and less and i do remember meeting with a, a manager a long a long time ago and it was like well you know you want to write okay so you're a writer or you're an actor and it was like you know it was kind of a bit like you know pick one and now i feel like it's way way more like you're saying you know multi multi hyphenates for sure and it's an advantage yeah yeah corbin did you have something uh, earlier uh oh yeah you briefly mentioned um getting a literary agent it's just a world i don't understand or know um how do you recommend people do that i mean it's difficult to get an agent anywhere but is there like sort of some avenues or like workshops or things that come to mind for somebody who's new and bright eyed? I mean, like getting an acting agent, there's so many ways that it could happen. Mm -hmm. um, you would need at least two samples. So like two feature length scripts that have been written. Um, if you don't have that, I think it would be very tough to get a literary agent. Certainly you can pitch yourself for meetings to try to get meetings cold. Mm -hmm referrals there's always friends you can ask for referrals who know your work and can vouch for you um there, if you place in a contest for example that is a great sort mm -hmm. of career update that might be a great time to strike while the iron's hot mm -hmm. to then pitch yourself to meetings um there's a lot of ways but you know those are a couple yeah that's awesome Thank that's you. great
Emily, what's something you wish you knew about the industry earlier on when you started? The biggest thing that I wish I had known a lot earlier was how important relationships are and how important it is to maintain those relationships and how, um, you know, I think as an, as actors, we sort of feel like, Ooh, I don't want to be pushy or needy or, uh, get blacklisted. You know, there's all this fear <laughs> around following up with the contacts that you have for actors, especially. And I wish that I had realized how important that was and, and would be, especially when, you know, all of the hoopla around the Sundance film was happening. I would have built so many more relationships. Um, I just didn't understand how the business worked. So that, that is the biggest thing for me is like, when you have an opportunity to make a connection, make it and then do the work to follow up with them over the long term because relationships don't just happen right they need to be nurtured and they happen over a long period of time but if you make that one of your highest priorities it will make a huge difference in your in your success i, I think that's also the there's certain relationships that <clears throat> you don't have to force if that makes sense, you can yes. stay on top of it and say, Hey, I'm going to follow up, but you don't have to force it. It's like, okay, that relationship is not happening. That's okay to let it go too. You know what I mean? It's like, well, I really want to stay in touch with them because they're this or this. It's like, well, no, that's okay to let that one go. This one over here that you've, you know, followed up with, followed up with. And then, you know, that's becoming something. Cause I think you're right. You can't, you can't speed it along. But I also think it's just that idea of like, well, you know, sometimes I've, I've noticed it's almost like people are wait they're, they're like waiting for someone to talk first, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yes. So like if you go, you know, like let's say you go to an audition or something and you see someone you've seen a hundred times at an audition or something and you say, hey, then they start, they're super chatty, but they're not gonna say, hey, first. And I think mm -hmm. that happens sometimes either on, you know, on set or at festivals where, you know, sometimes people are just, they, they want someone to, to, to chat with and who knows, you know, like like you're saying about relationships, that could be something that, 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 that turns into fruition of something. Um, but if you're not kind of, putting yourself a little bit out there and then also following up, you don't know because people's lives get busy and you know, they get busy too. Right. So yes. I, I think that's a great, um, that's a great one for the people you like, you know, connect with the people you want to work with and the people that like, you know, I think that's great. Yeah. And this kind of harkens back to what I was talking about before with, um, setting those ideal dynamics in terms of your hiring your team. I think that applies here as well. Like when you're, when you, find someone who shares creative values or life values or life experience or they're from the same hometown you know relationships aren't about what can you do for me it's about like how do we connect with human beings and do we have shared values that actually can apply to our jobs um and so when you are clear on the things that you value again you have that measure when you're building these new connections, like, does this person actually tick these boxes? And if you're in a situation, if one of your values is communication and you followed up with someone 27 times and they never responded, like, oh, this person doesn't share the value of communication. So I can, you know, very happily walk away from this relationship because it doesn't fit in with my own values. I also think when you're younger, it feels like you've got a lot more free time. Uh, whether that's true or not, I feel like you do. And so you're like, yeah, I'll hang out with this person. Who cares? Like you don't really, yeah. not that you're judging, but you don't really like almost like value that time. And then as you get a little older, you're that's much right. more pickier on who you'll spend Very time picky, with just because yes. you have, right? You get pickier. And so you kind of pull in, you know, and so the reason I think that's important is because it, 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 it takes some effort. It takes some, you know, investment to, to create friendships or to create networks. And I, you know, I, I, I love making friends. Like I've, I still like make friends and I love doing that, you know? And, and, and I always, I always tease my wife. I'm like, do you have any friends post college? She's like, I do two, two, I made two, you know, <laughs> which is, which is, which is, but she's like such a tight knit circle and my circles, you know, wider once again. But, but the point is I love doing what you're saying, Emily. And if I connect with that person, great, you know, they're busy, I'm busy, but I'm still going to try to make the effort to check in with them every once in a while, because who knows, maybe we want to work on a project. Maybe we just, you know, want to, lean on each other for something. So I think that's, that's really a wonderful way to look at it. Right. Um, Corbin, 
I think it might be time for uh, your, your best, best bad, bad acting. This is the exciting part. <laughs> I'm so excited. For we, get, <laughs> and we get to break out those Sundance skills, Emily. <laughs> this is the time. So what we're going to do, we're going to put a, a, a quote in the chat. Um, see if you if you recognize what it's from. Um, and if you don't, Corbin can tell you. It's just for fun. You get to have fun overacting it. That's part of the fun okay. of it. Um, do you recognize okay. what it's from? I don't recognize it. Corbin, it's uh, Betty Davis it? from Dark Victory. It's uh, from like yeah, the 1930s. Yeah, we went old school oh, for you. I yeah. <laughs> we I wanted something. Known. We wanted something from the golden age. So we were looking. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm excited. Oh, uh, exactly. So. Um, have have fun with it. You could you could say it. We may give you just a fun redirect or whatever, but just whenever you're ready, you could big, small, whatever you want. All right. All right. All right. I have an idea for this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, we like it. Ooh, turning. Nothing can hurt us now. What we have can't be destroyed. That's our victory. Our victory over the dark. It is a victory because we're not afraid. <laughs> yes. So fun. <laughs> <laughs> That was amazing, Corbin. Do you have any? Do you have a? That was so good. I'm, I'm I, loving gonna, it. I'm I was gonna, I was gonna it. do that. I was gonna do. Radio. I know. I know. She kind of so, nailed it. She kind of nailed, so nailed, uh, nailed it. I kind of want to go. I guess the other far okay. extreme, just like Valley Girl. Yeah. I just want to see <laughs> just like oh, Valley, day, Girl. Valley Girl. Okay. Oh see if that's fun. All right. Okay. Just gonna get the hair. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. She's got it. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes. 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 Like, nothing can hurt us now. What we have can't be destroyed. That's our victory. Our victory for the dark, it is a victory because we're not afraid. <laughs> Corbin, like. did you know Emily could do that so well? No, I mean, that was no amazing. Idea. The that like was, at the top. Like, oh, my God. I really wish oh. that's how she talked uh, back oh. in the day. I wish, like, there was one actress oh, yes. that did that. Oh, my God. That was so good. That was, I, yeah, I don't have anything. That was amazing. <laughs> That was amazing, Emily. Thank you. Oh my God. Well, way to end us on a high note. Emily, this yes. has just been wonderful. I've 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 learned so much. I love what you have to say. Your course sounds 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 lovely. Um so thank you so much for, for spending this time with us and, and being here. We we really appreciate it. I had a blast even early in the morning. I had a <laughs> yes. great time. So thank right. you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, lovely thank you. Lovely getting to know you and enjoy the rest of your day and, and thanks for uh stopping by. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. That was another great episode. Yes, so happy was. I, was a, I was a part of it and I was here for it. Uh, folks, don't forget to check out our website, themovingspotlight.com. We've got all our episodes up on there with um, our great images. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some stuff. Someone's know, putting a lot of effort onto that website. I don't want to say who, but, but somebody's put a lot, put of, time a lot effort of time and effort, so check it out. <laughs> and this episode with Emily was really a, was really a blast. Uh, she had a lot of great stuff to say. Yeah, so much really great stuff. Her. And if you're wanting to see John eat a muffin top throughout the entire video, check us out on YouTube. Emily was uh, kind enough not to make a comment, but John was enjoying that muffin top. <laughs> Emily didn't say anything. Just so everyone knows, they do sell. You can just get the muffin top now. And I bought one, and I had to eat it. Gen this genius episode. idea. You just, I, that's so, all I'm uh, in for, the muffin, too. So I don't need the bottom half. Yeah, I don't no, need the bottom half. Right. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. <laughs> I'll eat four muffin tops and no bottom halves. The yeah, best. so good. All right, let, let, let everybody go. We got it. We got all right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you for listening to the Moving Spotlight Podcast.